Welcome to Sarah Scuba and Travel Channel. If you plan on visiting New York City, I recommend allocating a day in your itinerary to visiting Liberty Island and Ellis Island. However, you will need to make reservations well in advance. I recommend doing so as soon as you book your transportation and lodging, especially if you want to participate in some of the specialized tours on the island. So let's talk about what you need to purchase and where. First, Statue City Cruises is the only authorized seller of tickets by the National Park Service. Do not purchase your tickets from any other sites or people on the streets. I've put a link to the vendor in the video description below to help you in your planning process. You must make your reservations in advance, which will allow you to schedule a security entry time. This is not the time the ferry leaves the dock. It is the time you are allowed to enter the security checkpoint. There is no cost to visiting Liberty Island or Ellis Island. If you aren't looking to do any extra tours at these locations, then you can simply purchase a ferry ticket. However, there are a few additional options that I recommend purchasing. For Liberty Island, you can purchase a ticket that allows you access to the crown where you can climb all the way to the top of the Statue of Liberty. This requires climbing stairs and there are a limited number of tickets available. This ticket also allows access to the pedestal. If you are not interested in climbing to the crown, I do recommend purchasing the ticket that allows you access to the pedestal alone. The cost is really not that much more than a regular ferry ticket, 30 cents to be exact, at the time of this recording. So I encourage you to take advantage of access to these areas. For Ellis Island, I highly recommend purchasing the Hard Hat Tour. This tour will take you out of the visitor center and into the hospital. It was a wonderful tour and I feel like it was definitely worth the additional cost. The money for the tour goes to supporting the organization Save Ellis Island, which is working to restore the hospital. If you decide not to participate in the tour, that's okay. Your regular ferry ticket also gives you access to Ellis Island. Regardless of which tours you select, you need to decide which port you will be departing from to take the ferry. Battery Park in Manhattan or Liberty State Park in New Jersey. Most likely you will depart from Battery Park in Manhattan. I recommend booking the earliest time available for the pedestal, most likely 9 a.m. Remember, this is when you will be allowed entry into the security checkpoint at Battery Park. This is not the time of your entry into the pedestal. You can arrive early to start the security process. These islands are national parks and federally protected. Therefore, to make this process easier, don't bring a lot of extra stuff that you don't need. Once you get through security, you can board the ferry. At this time of day, it is most likely the first ferry. Ferries depart Battery Park every 40 minutes. The first ferry stop is Liberty Island, so I recommend making your way to the top of the ferry to enjoy the views of Manhattan, the Brooklyn Bridge, and ultimately watch the Statue of Liberty come closer into view. Once you depart from the ferry, I recommend picking up an audio guide from the booth. There are three separate audio tours available, one for the outside perimeter, which takes approximately 40 minutes, one for the pedestal, and one for the Statue of Liberty Museum. Once you have your audio guide, head to the pedestal entry. You will need to show your times entry ticket and go through another security checkpoint. If you have large bags, they are required to be stored in the lockers outside the security screening area. This is another reason not to bring a lot of unnecessary items with you. Once you get through security, you can enter the bottom of the statue, which is actually Fort Hood from the 1800s. The fort is an 11 point star. Each point had a cannon at the time. When you enter the lobby, you will see a set of stairs in front of you on the opposite side of the room. Start making your journey up the stairs to the top of the pedestal. There are a total of 215 steps or the equivalent of 10 stories. As you make your way up, check out the signs that indicate the total number of stairs that remain. Not only do they help keep you motivated in climbing, but they offer interesting facts about the Statue of Liberty as well. Once you make your way to the pedestal, you can walk along the outside, giving you more views of Manhattan, as well as a different perspective of the Statue of Liberty and Fort Hood. The Statue of Liberty stands 300.5 feet from the ground to the top of the torch. When you're standing under the statue, you can really get a feel for how large she really is. When you're done with the outside, make a stop inside the pedestal and look up. You can actually see inside the statue and see the structure. This is a great view of the head and crown. 
If you do not secure tickets for entry into the crown, this is the next best view of the statue and stairs leading up to the crown. When you are ready, make your way down the stairs to exit. You will have the opportunity to exit at the base of the pedestal, which is also the top of the fort, for additional views and photo opportunities. Then continue down to the lobby where you initially entered and take some time to enjoy the museum display. There are exhibits discussing the history of the design, construction, and funding of the statue, as well as the pedestal. In France, Frédéric Auguste Barholdi sold tickets for people to tour his workshop and put on shows in the U.S. and France to fund the construction of the Statue of Liberty. In the U.S., the cost to build this pedestal was $300,000. The American Committee for the Statue of Liberty was able to raise half of the funds between 1877 and 1884. However, they ran out of funds for the statue's pedestal in 1884. Joseph Pulitzer came to the rescue and placed an ad in the New York World newspaper urging people to donate to completing the construction of the pedestal. He was able to raise $100,000 to finish the construction. That's because the U.S. paid for the pedestal and France paid for the statue. An item worth noting in this museum is the original bronze plaque of the sonnet The New Colossus by Emma Lazarus. If you do not schedule access to the pedestal, you can see a replica of this plaque in the Statue of Liberty Museum. There are also displays that present the role the Statue of Liberty has played in history. The statue was a symbol of friendship between the U.S. and France, but it was criticized as being a symbol of resistance and violence. Eventually, it became a universal symbol of freedom and democracy. However, it has also been widely criticized throughout the decades due to the inequalities within the U.S. There is a display for the historical satirical publications leaving one to question what does the statue really represent to various individuals in U.S. society. Take a few moments to read the quotes on the wall as you exit and reflect on the exhibit you just experienced. What is liberty? And what does it mean to you and others? Finally, check out the walls right outside the exhibit where you can see the original pilings of, for the statue. The last stop I recommend on Liberty Island is the Statue of Liberty Museum, which is on the opposite side of the tree-lined mall. Upon entry, I recommend making the line for the three-theater presentation, The Story of an Icon, which presents the history of the statue and pedestal to the current day struggles and challenges of what the statue represents to people in the U.S. and around the world especially as we continue to live in a country with unequal rights. I found it to be a very well done production. This museum also contains an exhibit to emulate Barholdi's workshop. There are replicas of the castings and tools that were used in the process for creating different parts of the statue. And you can stand next to a replica of her foot to see the true enormity of the size. Check out the size of this ear. This is a casting for one ear. Finally, you can stand next to her face and get a true feel of the scope of this piece. In fact, they even encourage you to touch it to see what her face feels like. In the museum, you can participate in an interactive exhibit where you can add your picture to the Becoming Liberty collage. You will see your picture appear on the corresponding wall. If you enter your email address at the end, your picture is emailed to you for free as a keepsake of your visit and participation with the exhibit. As you make your way to the end of the gallery and look towards the Statue of Liberty, you will see the original torch on display. Take some time to admire this historical piece. After visiting the museum, I recommend returning your audio tour device and making your way to the ferry. Ferries depart Liberty Island every 25 minutes to head to Ellis Island. In order to give yourself plenty of time at Ellis Island, I recommend trying to board the 1155 AM or the 1220 PM ferries. Again, I recommend heading to the top of the ferry or at least an outside area to get your last up close views of the Statue of Liberty. When booking your tickets for the Ellis Island hard hat tour, I recommend selecting one of the tours in the afternoon. I selected the 12 p.m. tour. Again, this is the time you enter the security checkpoint, but you don't have to worry about that because you have already dealt with this process and have been enjoying your time at Liberty Island. You will notice on the website that the 12 p.m. security entry means that you are joining the 2.30 p.m. tour. This will give you time to enjoy Ellis Island before your tour. 
The ferry ride is about five to 10 minutes to Ellis Island. After disembarking the ferry, you will be in front of the main building that is beautifully built in a French style. The building was supposedly designed this way to impress new arrivals. Make your way into the main building. Upon entry, you will see old suitcases in the middle of the large lobby. The reason the suitcases are there is to memorialize the tradition of new arrivals leaving their luggage in the large lobby before they headed upstairs to the second floor for processing. I recommend grabbing an audio tour device from the desk and head to the second floor. You will enter the registry room, which is the room that most people associate with Ellis Island. This is where immigrants would be bombarded with a loud and confusing environment to undergo inspection and registration. The room has been restored to resemble its appearance in the early 1900s. You may notice the balcony that surrounds the room. Due to the large number of immigrants, four to 5,000 per day, and the limited number of doctors, six in total, to more efficiently evaluate the new arrivals, the doctors would observe them from the balcony and try to identify individuals of concern from above. If they looked confused and did not understand instructions, were out of breath from climbing the stairs, or exhibited any physical symptoms, they would mark their clothing with chalk to indicate the individual needed to undergo further physical and psychological evaluations. The doors behind the restored desks were significant to the immigrants. If they were sent to the left door, they were allowed to enter the U.S. and they were going to New York City. If they were sent to the right door, then they were being sent to board a train or boat to another state. If they were sent to the middle door, they were being detained or sent to medical. Approximately two of every 100 immigrants were sent to medical or detained. After exploring this space, I recommend taking some time to go through the Through America's Gate exhibit, which highlights the different processing avenues individuals could undergo, especially those that were detained. New immigrants could wait three to five hours to undergo a brief medical exam and legal evaluation. In this exhibit, you will see the restored hearing room where 10% of new arrivals were sent for legal hearings. One of the common charges the board was trying to determine was if people were contracted laborers. Even though the U.S. needed workers and welcomed the influx of immigrants at the time, individuals with work contracts were sent back to their original countries. The U.S. did not want contract laborers for fear that these individuals were entering into a life of servitude and were not actually elevating their position in life. This exhibit also offers a glimpse at the medical equipment that was used to perform medical exams, including a device to check under people's eyelids for signs of trachoma, a bacterial infection caused by chlamydia. There is information on the types of psychological tests that were performed to determine if psychological disorders were present or if the confusion was initially displayed due to a language difference. I particularly appreciated this response highlighted from one of the individuals tested. There is also a display of the money that was exchanged and the federal orders for meals the detainees received. Finally, there are original pieces of the walls where graffiti from detainees was discovered after paint chipped away. After making your way through this area, take some time to explore the Peak Immigration Years exhibit, which is also on this floor. Most likely you will not have a lot of time, but it's worth a walk through. There are original steamship tickets, immigration documents, and boat manifests. There are items and immigrants brought with them on display. I have to highlight these kids' shoes from different cultures. They were so cute and ornate. Pay close attention to the anti-immigrant propaganda that is on display. You will notice it's not that much different from the current anti-immigration messages in the U.S. today. Finally, make a quick ascent to the third floor. You may not have a lot of time to explore this floor, but I recommend visiting the dormitory room to get an idea of what the living conditions were like for the individuals who were detained. Also take a quick walk through the Treasures from Home exhibit, which displays more items immigrants brought with them to the U.S., as well as the Restoring a Landmark exhibit highlighting the restoration of Ellis Island after it was closed in 1954 and sat vacant for decades. Liberty Centennial in 1986 sparked the restoration project of the main building. Pay close attention to your timing. I recommend making sure you give yourself time to get some lunch before your hard hat tour. There is a cafe available on the first floor. They offer a variety of options. The food is overpriced, but where else are you going to go? 
Luckily, the food was very good and there were a lot of options. If you have time after lunch, you can make a quick walk through the journeys, the peopling of America exhibit. However, I found making my way past the American Family Immigration History Center records search area and exploring the citizenship gallery and the journeys, new eras of immigration exhibits to be very humbling. The citizenship gallery highlights the process individuals go through today to become citizens of the United States, including the 100 possible questions that can appear on the naturalization test. I bet most natural born citizens cannot answer all of these questions. The Journeys New Eras of Immigrations exhibit highlights the reasons why individuals tried to enter the U.S. legally and illegally, and the challenges they experienced through the entire process. I think it is important to remember that immigration occurred prior to January 1st, 1892, when Ellis Island first opened, and continues today long after it closed in 1954. The change has been in the origin of where people are immigrating from and the needs of the U.S. Warning, you will feel rushed if you try to tackle all of these exhibits that I have mentioned so far for Ellis Island. So if you want to take your time, you might want to select two or three exhibits to spend your time in. You will not have enough time after the hard hat tour to go back into the museum. So decide what is of most interest to you. When it is time for your tour, you will need to check in at the information desk and meet your tour leader. You will be led into the restricted area of the hospital. Video is not allowed during the hard hat tour, so I want to highlight some of the sights you will experience during this tour. First, you will be required to wear a hard hat, hence the name. The hospital is an active construction site, so you must keep your hat on for the entire tour. You will come to a Y split in the hallway. This separated the general hospital and infectious disease unit. You will tour the infectious disease area. The first stop is the laundry, where you will see many of the original machines. They believed that sheets needed to be flat and crisp to prevent bed sores. They washed and pressed two to 3,000 pieces per day. Next is the outdoor area, where you can see different units. Of interest here is the differences between the men's psychiatric unit and the women's psychiatric unit. The men had an outside caged area where they could at least go outside and get some fresh air. The women didn't even have a porch. The pictures on the wall in the men's porch is an original picture of men that were housed in this unit. As you make your way through the hospital, you will see more of these portraits throughout. These are original select pieces by artist J.R. who created this gallery throughout the hospital titled Unframed. The images are designed to bring the history of the space to life and remind visitors of the real individuals who lived and worked here. Another stop in the tour is the medical examiner's auditorium. This was a teaching hospital and autopsies were performed in front of students and doctors. The mortality rate was only about 1.5% for the entire time the Ellis Island Hospital was in operation. Another stop is the large terminally ill or palliative care room. This room has one of the best views of the Statue of Liberty. There is a rumor that as patients' conditions worsen, their beds move closer and closer to the window so that they could enjoy the view. You will also visit the operating room where there was a sink with a heater on display to demonstrate how the doctors and nurses would wash in for the operations. Another interesting aspect of this room is that all of the corners are rounded, including the ceiling and floor. The reason is because they believed that germs lived in the corners and it was to help keep the room sterile. Another stop is the tuberculosis wing, where each patient had their own rooms. In these rooms, you will notice that there are two sinks. The higher, smaller sink was used for patients to spit and cough up excrement. The waste and water from these sinks had their own plumbing and removal system, so the biological waste never entered the water supply. The other sink was used for regular use. Another highlight is the measles room. You will notice that there are four holes in the wall around the door. In this room, they had separate vents that went to the outside exhaust system. When they opened the windows, this created a negative pressure room to remove the exposed air and making sure that infected air never mixed with any of the other air in the hospital. A negative pressure room may sound familiar from hospital practices during COVID-19 as a way to contain the virus and minimize its spread to other areas of the hospital. I have to say, it is pretty impressive how advanced they were, especially for trying to run a hospital on an island. 
They had full plumbing and electric, and only two staff members passed away during the entire time the hospital was in operation. Finally, you will visit one of the on-site homes where two doctors lived with their families. In 2009, Nancy, one of the children who grew up in the house, joined the tour and gave a tour guide quite a surreal experience when she was able to provide information about the quarters, when the home wasn't even part of the tour at the time. Today, you can view pictures and a letter that Nancy shared with the organization at, that are on display on the hearth. If you have time and money, I highly encourage you to participate in a hard hat tour. The Save Ellis Island group does not receive any funds from the federal government. All of the restoration is paid for through the sale of tickets and donations. If you would like to provide support for this project, I will post a link in the description below. After the tour, you will have a minimal time before the last ferry departs back to Battery Park. If you want to hit the gift shop and explore the exterior, this is your chance to do so. Once it is time to board the ferry, make sure you are boarding the ferry to the proper destination, New York or New Jersey. Then sit back and enjoy the ride as you will probably be pretty tired at this point. It is a full day adventure when visiting these two historical sites. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that like button. If you would like to help support future productions, please donate using the super thanks button or buying me a snack using the link in the description below. Please join the Facebook group and follow me on Instagram for more content.